Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be talking about binomial nomenclature. And I didn't put a title on here, but I'll do that now. Binomial nomenclature. Okay, so the learning objectives today are to know why scientists had to develop their own type of specific naming system for different organisms, to know the correct order of the system for how scientists name organisms, and to know the general um, differences between the six kingdoms of life and all the details that go with each. And uh, a lot of this will have also been done via your reading notes as well in class. So uh, I'll be mentioning some pages from your book, but um, you'll see some of the uh, picture specifically from your textbook that will help with distinguishing among the six kingdoms. So this is the picture from your book. It's on page 459, and I should have made you copy it down. It is a very good picture for showing you the different domains, the different kingdoms that the domains fall on, that the fall within the domains, the different cell types and cell structures under each kingdom, the number of cells, whether it's unicellular or multicellular, and examples and um, mode of nutrition being either heterotrophic or autotrophic or both. All right, now, <clears throat> we use scientific names basically because it eliminates confusion. So if you take this little guy over here on the right-hand side of the screen, this little guy can be known as a roly-poly, a sow bug, a pill bug, a potato bug, or a tumble bug. And it changes from person to person, region to region. It really just depends on where you are. And so this really doesn't work well for science. We want solid, simple names that will be clear no matter where you are that will exist in every in every situation so we use scientific names to eliminate this confusion so the scientific name for this guy is right here armadillium bulgara uh, like armadillo armored and then you can think of vulgar like bulgara for insects if you like but that's the scientific name for this little guy and it's the scientific name whether you're here in America, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in South Africa, it doesn't matter where you are, that's the scientific name all around the world. So these are the general names, and we don't like to use those in science, we like to use the scientific name. Now, binomial nomenclature was originally developed by a gentleman by the name of Carlos Linnaeus. Um, and he came up with this system where each species gets a two-part scientific name. The first part is what he called the genus name. The second part is what he called the species name. You're italicizing with the genus, and the genus name is always, always capitalized. The species name is always lowercase. So Armadillium vulgara, the A is capitalized, the V is lowercase. The genus, and then is named, excuse me, the genus name is Armadillium, the species name is Vulgara. So the study of classification of this type is called taxonomy. And it was taxonomists who first developed the system like Carlos Linnaeus did, and others refined it to where it includes actually other types of names as well. But for most things, you can get away with saying just the genus and the species name, and that will be enough. Now, for instance, Myotis lucenificus uh, Lucenificus, excuse me, is the brown bat. That's the common name. Myotis crescentis, well, that's the gray bat. And you notice they have the same genus name. Ursus americanus is the American black bear. Ursus arctos, the American brown bear, or the Canadian brown bear. Um, Panthera leo, that's the African lion. Panthera anca, any ideas of what it would be? Well, if you're following along with the basic patterns, you notice, again, sometimes the genus name is the same for multiple species. So bats tend to be the myotises, bears tend to be the ursus, there's always exceptions to this. Panthera, like the word panther, well, this is a type of cat, and specifically, this would be the American uh, jaguar. Excuse me. Yeah, can't spell jaguar, but it's the jaguar. <clears throat> now, you will be responsible for knowing the different levels of the taxonomic rankings, and I have a very simple way to help you remember this. And 
it tends it came actually out of a middle school student I had and it tends to work no matter what you do um, the highest rank is called the domain there's only three of them and then below that is kingdoms phylums class order family genus species and you may have learned uh, a way to remember this in middle school if that's working for you great otherwise I might suggest the following do keep penguins clean or frogs get sad um, domain kingdom phylum class order family genus and then finally species names so whatever way you have to remember it just make sure you remember it in the proper order so for example <clears throat> the kingdom animalia that I'm not showing the domain here but the domain would be um, eukaryota but the kingdom animalia includes all animals everything from stuff like sea stars to grizzly bears to red foxes all the animals and then as we narrow it down to the phylum chordata those that have notochords you'll notice the sea star is now gone where it was here so we're narrowing the field down we narrow it down to the class mammalia well that's mammals so you'll notice the snake is now gone because that's a reptile it's in the reptile family or the reptile um excuse me the reptile class uh the order carnivora so now the squirrel's gone because it's not a carnivore and again we're narrowing narrowing the field down and then we get down to the family ursidae the general bear family and then more specifically ursus the true bears and then finally to the genus species name of ursus arctos the brown bear so again all life has a taxonomic name at every level so here is the full list of names for one specific organism here is the full list of names for another specific organism and you'll notice initially they start off the same eukarya for the domain name animalia so they're both eukaryotic creatures mean they have eukaryotic cells things with nucleuses mitochondria chlor um, not necessarily chloroplast per se but mitochondria golgi apparatus um uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum things like that they're both animals because they're in the kingdom animalia phylum chordata meaning they both have a notochord excuse me both in the class mammalia so they're both mammals and then here at the order level is where they start to become different notice here we have the order carnivoria probably a carnivore and here a primate family philidae family hominidae genus lynxus genus homo and then species rufus and then species sapiens so you can tell up to a point certain similarities that creatures share based upon the taxonomic rankings so whereas one is a bobcat and the other is a human you can tell that at the very least they both have eukaryotic cells both animals both have notochords essentially um, they have vertebrae to be very uh, general about that both mammalia but after that point is where we see the differences start to emerge and you would see this also on an evolutionary tree as well so you are responsible for learning about and remembering the three domains and really it's quite simple you have the archaea the bacteria and the eukarya and for a long time scientists considered the archaea and the bacteria the same thing they just called it bacteria then they figured out there was actually a difference between some of the bacterias and so they divided them up into two domains and each of these two domains has only one kingdom the archaea has a kingdom called archaea under it and the bacteria has a kingdom called eubacteria under it and so these are both prokaryotes meaning their cells are simple bacterial cells uh, no nucleuses no uh, endoplasmic reticulums nothing as complex as a eukaryote cell which is the domain eukarya which has four kingdoms the protista the fungi the plants and the animals so here is a nice picture showing that same basic relationship again notice this is more of an evolutionary tree because it does show oh, there's some black does show the common ancestor for all the <clears throat> three domains you have the bacteria the archaea and the eukaryota and the eukarya has four kingdoms underneath leading to the protists the plants the fungus and the animals so this is a very general view of the tree of life here's a, another general view again you have the domain bacteria over here by itself and then the domain archaea and then here would be the domain eukarya which the label is right here which has as i said before four kingdoms the plants the funguses the animals and this is the protists over here 
So we're going to focus on studying the major differences in the different kingdoms now. So I've clarified the three domains. We're going to move down into the kingdoms. And again, uh, you should make sure you get a copy of this picture from page 459 of your textbook. If you haven't already done so for your reading notes, it is an excellent picture. And I do make sure, recommend you make sure you actually do have an accurate copy of this. All right, the basics. <clears throat> bacteria, as I said, this is one kingdom under the domain of, uh, our, of bacteria. Excuse me. Um, these guys are... The kingdom itself is eubacteria. They are prokaryotes, so again, no nucleuses, no mitochondria, no major organelle systems. They do have DNA, they do have a cell wall, they do have ribosomes, um, and they do have um, parts like um, uh, um, parts outside the cell that will actually help them move around. But typically, they're prokaryotes. They do um, always end up being unicellular, so one cell per organism. And the thing that separates them from the other bacteria we're going to mention in just a second is their cell walls are made of this stuff called peptidoglycan, which is actually kind of like a mesh, like you can think of it like kind of a net. It's a combination of amino acids and sugars. It kind of works to help protect them from um, hostile environments. They can be autotrophic or heterotrophic, so they can actually do photosynthesis in some cases. Photo synthesis. Uh, Blue-green algae uh, would be an example, but there are some bacteria that can in fact do photosynthesis even though they don't have um, chloroplasts. The other bacterial uh, domain, the archaea with the kingdom, they call it archaebacteria. That's another name for it. Again, they're also prokaryotes, none of the major organelles, but their cell walls lack this peptidoglycan mesh that I've talked about before. Uh, they're also unicellular, just like the other ones, and they can, again, be autotrophic or heterotrophic. And I'm showing you a picture of an example there, methanogen on the right. All right. The domain eukarya, however, has, as I said before, four kingdoms. You have the protists, the fungus, the plants, and the animals. So we're going to go through each of these and make sure we're clear on the differences, because even though they're all eukaryotes, meaning they all have the major organelles that we've studied, uh, there are some fundamental differences between these four kingdoms. All right, so on to the domain, or the, excuse me, the kingdom protista. This is one of the hardest kingdoms to really generalize, because um, for a long time, the protista was known as the junk drawer of the kingdoms, meaning if we had something, we're not quite sure if it's a plant or a fungus or an animal in some weird cases, this is where they ended up. Um, there, there could be lots of different varieties of protists. Some are more animal-like, some are more plant-like, some are more fungus-like, but something about them doesn't fit. Like the paramecium here is probably an animal-like protist. It can actually, in some cases, hunt for food, but it's single cellular. So most are unicellular, but there are some that are multicellular. And when it's unicellular, well, it's obviously not an animal because all animals are multicellular. But there are other multicellular protists that are plant-like or fungus-like. And some have chloroplasts, so they can do photosynthesis, so they're autotrophic. Um, some will have cell walls, but the cell walls are not like the cell walls of plants. They're not exactly the same. And so... Protists tend to be this thing where there's a lot of variety, but none of them quite fit in with the other three kingdoms of plants, animals, and um, funguses. So when we come across something and we're not sure where it falls, it usually ends up in the protist kingdom. So next up is the kingdom fungi, and again, these are eukaryotes, so their cells have uh, nucleuses, mitochondria, um, chlor um, not chloroplasts, excuse me. That's a mistake. I should make sure I clarify that. But they'll have endoplasmic reticulums, Golgi apparatuses, things of that nature. So they are eukaryotes. They have cell walls, just like plants do, but their cell walls are made of this stuff called chitin, which is actually the same general compound used to make insect exoskeletons. Most of them are multicellular. There are a few unicellular kinds, but not many. But this is what separates them from plants. They are heterotrophic. They have to eat other organisms. There are no autotrophs. And because there's no autotrophic fungi, there's no chloroplasts. 
just like there's no chloroplasts in plant, or excuse me, in animals either. So they're heterotrophic, which is what the main difference between the fungus kingdom and the plant kingdom. They have to consume other organisms, dead decaying organisms usually. Um, the reproduction method is very complex in some cases. In some cases they'll use spores, in some cases they'll use large uh, underground nodules underground. They're not technically roots because roots only exist with plants per se, but they're not animals and they're definitely not plants. And then speaking of which, the plant kingdom, most of you should be familiar with. These have cell walls, as I said before. These cell walls are not made of chitin, but made of cellulose. They have chloroplasts so that they can do photosynthesis because most of them are autotrophic. You can find occasional heterotrophic varieties of plants that will eat insects like the Venus flytrap, but by and large, most of them do photosynthesis. Uh, again, they're eukaryotes. Their cells have all the major organelles, including chloroplasts. to do photosynthesis. So, and of course we know now that um, the light that's best for, the light, excuse me, that's worst for photosynthesis is green light. Hence, photosynthesis um, tends to reflect green from the plants because that's the worst type of light for doing photosynthesis. And then finally, kingdom animalia. Again, eukaryotes, kingdom's animalia. So they have all the major organelles except for chloroplast. There's no chloroplast because animals are heterotrophic. They have to consume other organisms, whether that be grass, whether that be plants, whether that be funguses, whether that be other animals. All animals are heterotrophic. They're multicellular, and you'll notice one of the big things um, oh, they also don't have any cell walls, but you'll notice one of the big things that's not on here you might always associate with animals is mobility. Turns out mobility is not a definitive characteristic for thinking of animals. Most animals can move, but there is in fact at least one type of animal I can think of that doesn't move, and that's one of the more primitive animals, the sponge. Maybe it has an E on the end. So sponges are actually in the animal kingdom but they don't move. They're filter feeders. They just sit there attached to the ground and they let the um, sift of the ocean currents come through them and they filter out the little organisms and consume those. So even though sponges are technically immobile, they are still animals. So mobility doesn't define the animal kingdom. And again, make sure you've gotten a copy of this picture from page 459, either in your reading notes or in your notes at some point, and make sure you know it well.